There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with my first Friday Reads of August, first Friday Reads for Women in Translation Month, and boy do I have things to tell you. And they're all concentrated on only one particular aspect of what I usually check in about on my Friday Reads, because that's the only one in which there's been any movement, and has there been movement in that particular category, boys and girls? <sighs> but before I get into any of that, <laughs> I just poke myself... Not in the eye, but in the just be b below my eyebrow and just above my eye with scissors. I was tr trying to trim my unruly eyebrows for you people, and I stuck myself just there. Can you see it? It's stopped bleeding. It doesn't hurt, but I'm a little bit embarrassed. In Canada, we could go to hair salons for this kind of thing, but in Japan, it's not really a thing, so... Japanese people have the most fabulous eyebrows, and they do it all themselves. And occasionally I ask Kenji to, to do it, but now that he's cutting my hair, I don't want to, you know, burden him unduly with my unruly eyebrows. So I try to do it myself, and, uh, yeah, that's about the state of things in my world, other than books. So let's move on to the books. I have so much to tell you, and so I, have n I didn't finish anything. I didn't bail on anything. I started eight books and excited to tell you what they are. Most of them were for Women in Translation Month, and I'll start with those. So I have started Miyako Kawakami's Breasts and Eggs, a big tome, new, newly translated by two dudes. It's the most forgettable names on the planet, Sam Bett and David Boyd. Never heard of those guys, but so far I would say they've done a pretty good job of translating this. And this is... Uh, I've only read, what, 40 pages? Maybe not even that. No, 40 pages. And I like it. It is very detailed, and I saw on Goodreads that some of my friends, some of the reviews said there was just too much detail here for them, and I'm still early days, but I am feeling immersed. And it is about poor, working-class Japanese women. Two adult sisters, the narrator, I don't know if she's the narrator, I can't remember. The main character has never married, and she's a writer wannabe. She has moved from Osaka to Tokyo years and years ago, and her Osaka sister and her teenage daughter, who doesn't speak to anyone, have come to visit. So that the Osaka single mom can get breast implants. And so that's where breasts come into the story. I mean, that may not be the only place breasts come into the story, but it's really good and it's about characters in Japanese fiction that you don't often encounter. It's evocative of Yuko Tsushima's fiction, uh, particularly Child and Fortune. This is a much longer novel so I'm really uh, eager to see where it goes. I'm going to take my sweet time, although I wouldn't mind finishing it up this month. Uh, Miyako Kawakami is appearing at the, is it the Edinburgh Art Writers Festival, whatever it's called. I have signed up for the, it's all online this year, I've signed up for her talk. I'll put a link in the show notes to that, and you can too. It'd be kind of nice to have it finished by that time, which I believe is at the end of August. But yeah, it's starting out really good. Every time I've talked about this book, I've called it Sokcho, but in fact I keep missing the title. The first two words are here. Winter in Sokcho by Elisa Shua Dusapin, translated from the French by Anissa Abbas Higgins, who read from this on Tina Cover's new Translators Aloud channel. I'll put a link to Tina's, it's not only Tina, Tina and I believe Tina Cover and Charlotte Kuhn have created this channel for translators to read their translated work. And I just, the other day, maybe last night, watched Anissa Abbas Higgins read from this book. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. Again, maybe 20 pages in, I'm going to be recording a chat with Grace Eichmeyer about this novella next week, so I will easily have it finished by then, but I'm really liking the writing slash translation, and the story is interesting. It's set on a resort, kind of a shabby resort in Sokcho, which I believe is close to the border between South Korea and North Korea, and a biracial Korean-French young woman who works there gets interested, I don't know what kind of interest yet, gets interested in a guest at the guest house who is French manga artist or they, we don't call them manga artists if they don't live in Japan do we graphic graphic novelist graphic something or other it hooked me from the first couple pages 
Speaking of getting hooked from the first couple pages, I am not many more pages than two. I'm 20 pages into Cora Sandel's Alberta Alone. This is the third volume of her Alberta trilogy. I've been reading one a year every year for Women in Translation Month, translated from the Norwegian, uh, probably the most beautiful translation I've ever read by Elizabeth Rokan. And this is just as beautiful as all the others so far. So she's much older here, and I can't figure out her relation to the family that she lives with. Maybe she's just a friend. I'm not far enough in to know, but it's intriguing. Uh, it just as was the Sunday sentence that I used last week about the man of that household. His face is misshapen, and the very last word in the sentence says, from the sword thrust. So he had been very badly disfigured in some kind of a sword fight here prior. So, gotta find out what that's all about. It's just, she's my favorite writer. One of them. Oh my god, this woman can write, and this woman, other woman, can translate. I'm gonna take my sweet time with this. I don't want to finish this up much before Christmas because I want to savor every sentence. Also, only 20 pages into Trieste by Dasha Durndic, translated from the Croatian by Ellen Elias Bursak and this is a completely different animal the opening chapter read like fiction and then no that's not I don't think it was a chapter the opening 10 pages read like fiction and then the last 10 pages read like gorgeously written history and I am not complaining about those last 10 pages they were utterly engrossing about what happened, it's set, I, I don't know how much of the action is set in Trieste, but the nearby city or town called Gorizia. Gorizia is now in Italy, but a large part of what I've read so far is about all of the various wars and where that, is it a city? It's called a town by Wikipedia. Um, which empires it was conquered by and so on and especially focusing on world war one where there were so many battles at a river nearby the soka river and battles between italy and the austro-hungarian empire there were actually 12 battles each of which has their own wikipedia page because they were so militarily important and deadly and in this novel durnditch does a much more literary job of explaining a lot of that casualties which includes killed, missing in action, and prisoners. Of all of the 12 battles along the Soka River, 1.2 million Italians, 1.3 million Austrians. Just those 12 battles on that one river in World War I. And her family is completely enmeshed in all this. The main character, who we've just met in the first 10 pages as a very old woman waiting for someone to come visit. Wow, this is really heavy and... Uh, I'm just captivated. I don't want to finish this much before <clears throat> this time next year. I'm going to take it slow. That's an exaggeration, but I don't necessarily care if I finish it this year. I am spending as much time on Wikipedia as I am with the book, and I'm just gobsmacked by how, how alive the history is. Wow. And one more, and I have a funny story about this, which is that I have a subscriber named... I was going to call, I said his name is Dane. It's not Dane. He's Danish. Oh my God. Oh, I, I was half right. His YouTube handle is Daytona Dane. I don't think, I don't imagine Dane is his real name, but could be, but he's Danish. He lives in Daytona. Maybe I didn't need to tell you that. And I, in a recent ebook haul, I had talked about a new ebook, as one does in an ebook haul, um, that I was considering very strongly considering doing for Women in Translation Month from Denmark A Change of Time by Ida Jessen. But then, you know, I had so many contenders that I completely forgot about it when I came, it came time to put my wit TBR together. When I put my TBR video up, Daytona Dane signed again. He's a very frequent commenter. He's a wonderful commenter. And said... Your TBR looks great, but what happened to the Ida Jessen book? What? Did I look it up? Oh, yeah, I was planning to read this one, too. So I put a comment back and said, well, if I don't fit it, I kind of forgot about it. If I don't get to it this year, let's, why don't you and I buddy read it next year? 
but I also <laughs> didn't have my wits about me when I put my wit Women in Translation Month TBR together because I had a book on there by an Indian male writer. <laughs> Somebody told me in the comments, and I don't know where my head was at. I think I had a book written by a female writer from India in translation in my mind, but somehow I got a different ebook by an Indian male writer in translation on my TBR. I'm not going to even mention it again because I don't want to draw people's attention to my show notes where I talk about this embarrassing mistake. So... I, that book is off my TBR. So, when I realized I'd made this silly mistake, I thought, aha, I will be able to fit Ida Jessen in after all. So I have started it, and no, I have not forgotten the translator. I just haven't gotten to his name yet. It translated from the Danish by Martin Aitken, who is a very well-known translator of not only Danish literature, I think other Scandinavian languages. And I am... Not far into it, actually only 10%. It is very short chapters in the form of journal entries about a woman who's visiting her husband who's... He's got some kind of neurological something or other and he seems like he's dying. And she's very alone on the, I think, on the farmhouse and she goes to visit him. And most of the time he's just sleeping. And that doesn't sound very interesting, but though it's really holding my interest. It's, the writing is gorgeous. I will keep fitting that in and around the edges. I'm pretty sure Daytona Dane would have told me if I had mistaken Ida Jessen's gender, so I think I'm okay. But gender so confusing, people. So those are the ones in progress for Women in Translation, as well as the Margarita Liberaki, which I will finish up this weekend. And I have also started and I'm probably most impressed of all of the ones that have all been very positive that I've been reading. This one has blown me away so far. Shugi Bane by Douglas Stewart. Debut novel, newly published, and made the Booker long list. And I told you I wasn't going to talk about the Booker anymore. And I am going to break my own rule and say, 40 pages in, I am going to vow to you all that if Shugi Bain wins the Booker, I am going to follow the Booker obsessively in 2021. I am vowing to read the entire long list, not necessarily, you know, on a timely basis, but that I will read the entire short list. Eric, are you watching? Are you listening to this? <laughs> I will read the entire short list before the prize is announced, if this one wins. Because this, from page one, from page five, by page five, I thought this is Booker-worthy fiction. This is just gorgeously written. I love it so much. So far, we've been in two time frames. The most recent one, Shugi Bain is 16, and he's leaving home and living in a really terrible guest house. Guest house seems to be the theme of this week's reading. He's still going to school, but barely. And he had to lie about his age, and most of the guest houses wouldn't rent to him because he was obviously 16, but this one place did and the people that he meets there the other men the smell of them they don't shower the they the smell of cigarette smoke and booze and he's got a part-time job at a grocery store and in this is set in glasgow i'm just pulled in so deep i could smell everything and taste everything and feel everything and his name is shugi bane and he's gay and then now i'm into an earlier phase of his life when, uh, i'm into a scene when he's a baby with his parents, who are very, very unhappy people. I just absolutely love the writing. Uh, I can't believe it's a debut novel. And, you know, there's lots of time for things to go south. But I have not been this impressed by the first 40 pages of a novel in a long, long time. This is a buddy we haven't checked in yet with Ollie Bliss. But Ollie and I will be checking in on Monday on the first 82 pages. Just a couple days ago, when I was on about page 20, I thought, did I ever check to see if Scribd has the audiobook? And if I did, I'd forgotten. But sure enough, Scribd has the audiobook, narrated by a Scottish narrator. And as soon as I started listening and reading, I knew that I was going to do this as an audio text combo from here on in, because adding that Scottish accented narration to my experience of reading this book. I started loving it twice as much. 
So now I want to talk for a bit about audiobooks. I've been having some bad experiences with audiobooks to the point where I thought maybe I'm almost pretty much done. You've heard me say that before. And now I discover the Shugi Bane. It seems to work for Irish, now Scottish novels. If I can find an audio narrator that'll tell me the story, read it to me in the authentic accent. And British, like I did the Clarissa Volume 1. I'm a happy camper, but... Uh, otherwise, I don't have much luck. So I have to tell you, this is something I forgot to mention with all of my takedown review and other comments about that awful novel by Ann Patchett. What was it called? The Dutch House? That audiobook was narrated by Tom Hanks, and I'm going to uh, sharply disagree with many of you out there. I couldn't stand his narration. I started out doing audio text combo, and I just thought his voice was horrible. He, and his reading of the book was terrible. So after about an hour, I, get, I just threw the audiobook in the trash and kept going with the, with the text only. And I had that... Do you remember a couple of weeks ago I was talking about arrogant-sounding voices? Well, Tom Hanks now, in his, at this age, this stage of his life, he sounds like an arrogant prick. I'm not saying he is... But I think he must be. If you talk like that, you, you are like that, I think. Um, and he's such a beloved actor, but who cares about actors? After his coronavirus thing, he was on Saturday Night Live or something, and I watched it on YouTube, and I had to turn it off after two minutes because like, I couldn't stand his voice and his manner. He just sounded like an arrogant prick. And that's how he sounded in the audiobook, so that didn't work. And a few weeks ago, I told you that I was doing the Joyce Carol Oates book, Night, Stars, Death, the Sky. Is that right? No. Night, Sleep, Death, the Stars on audiobook and reading the, te reading the e-book when I had time, but basically doing it as an audiobook on my exercise bite. Well, that audio narration was terrible. So again, after about an hour, I just got rid of the audio component altogether. And now... I am reading the ebook on my exercise bike, and I am now exercise biking three times a day instead of two because I need it to make sure I could fit into my new blouse that just arrived in the mail yesterday. Isn't it fabulous? Some people say they can't read on an exercise bike, and I could see holding a physical book would be difficult, but reading an ebook, it's it works like a charm. So I am just moving through that 900-page novel at a steady clip, but the audio narration was just. She wasn't adding anything to the experience, and she was kind of taking away just in some weird emphases and just very much like Tom Hanks. Like she was just the word she would stress in the sentence or not stress that I thought, what was, what does she even, is she even paying, are they even paying attention to what they're reading? It was just jarring. So, but now I have found a gorgeously narrated audiobook for Shugi Bane. So, you win some, you lose some. Oh my, I am going on, aren't I? Yeah, I forgot to say, I got this in the mail. I ordered it off the internet and uh, quite happy with it. And I have started two for Canada Athon. I have started Thomas King's nonfiction, The Inconvenient Indian, a curious account of, of Native people in North America. And this is kind of like a people's history of indigenous people across North America. And he writes in a very breezy style. I'm not sure what I think of it yet. I've only read 20 pages, but it's certainly entertaining, and I'm learning stuff. I just read last night about a war in what is now British Columbia between an indigenous tribe and some of the gold rush miners, and that was actually, it's, called, it's thought of it to be a war. The 1858 Fraser Canyon War. A group of miners uh, raped a woman from this tribe, and I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. Nalakapamax, I've never heard that tribe name before. And then there was a uh, retaliation and, and there was a, a war. The uh, miners were from America. Uh, I didn't know about that before I read this book, so yeah, I'm going to get stuff out of it. And finally, I have started translated from the gibberish, Seven Stories and One Half Truth by Anash Irani. And I am, I don't know how far I'm into the first, the title story. I am 20 pages in. How much more is there of this title story? 
Looks like there's about another 10 pages of the story. I haven't decided whether I like it yet, but it's holding my interest. It's about a Indo-Canadian man who returns home to Mumbai and the doctor's wife who lived across the way in the apartment building ever since he was a small child has died and he's trying to write and he's fixated by the fact that the retired doctor has not brought her old undergarments in off the balcony where they have been hanging to dry since before her death and that's really all that's happened so far I'm not sure about it but uh, yeah I will let you know how it goes later quite a bit of good stuff on the go I have no idea what I'm gonna start I had hoped to have two books at least two books finished for today and I just didn't get there I could have killed myself and stayed up till 2 a.m. to finish it but that would have been silly Next week I'm going to have a slew of stuff finished. So I don't know exactly what I'm going to start. I've got TBRs coming out the wazoo and stuff. Other than that, I think the next book that I start for Women in Translation will be Ingborg Bachmann's Malina, which is translated from the German by Philip Bohm. This could be because this is also for read more German books, and I want to get a whole bunch more German books read by the end of the year, so I want to get this one started. I have read one short story by Bachman that I absolutely love. I hear really good things about this. So this one definitely and probably a couple more. Thanks for watching.